Now we're going to get to the third big decision. And really, this is what most people are thinking about when they think about estate planning. It's who gets what, when do they get it, and maybe even how do they get it. Now, I really do recommend that we keep things as simple as we can, but at the same time, getting you to what you want. So, it's very common for my clients who are married with kids to say, oh, well, I want everything to go to my spouse, and if I, you know, if my spouse goes before me, then I want it to go equally to the kids. That's fine. That's easy. It's very common as well. But what I also do to take it at least one step further is and we have to think about this, and believe me, a lot of my clients hate when we talk about this. Well, what happens if one of those children passes on before you, but they have kids? Do you want their interest to kind of drop down to those grandkids? Most of the time it's yes. Sometimes I hear no, but I hear it in the context of, oh, well, they're just too young. They can't handle it. Well, no, that's what the financial person is for. They can manage that money until they reach an age that's appropriate. And we'll get back to that in a minute. So I try to go through at least a couple of layers deep so that we have contingencies. Well, what if this person passes on? Where does it go? And then maybe what if something happens to them? Where does that go? And another thing, set of criteria I really advise my clients to look at. Please don't start saying, well, I want the dining room table to go here. And I want this bank account to go here. And let's talk about the house going here. And let's, okay, if you're depending on particular assets to go to particular people, but what you really are trying to do is apportion things out fairly, your assets may change dramatically in five to 10 years. You may no longer bank with that bank, and now that becomes invalid in your document. You've moved. That house is no longer going to someone, and now they're disinherited. So I always encourage people to think in terms of percentages. You could have multiple millions of dollars, or you may have even less than 100000 But if you're doing percentages, it's just a percentage of whatever the assets are at the time going to the correct people. So I always encourage people to look at all of those different little contingencies and at least take it a couple of levels deep. Now, I also did mention age limits. A lot of my clients are looking, you know, the, the days of, oh, well, if they're 18, they can handle it. Most of the time, no. 21, they can handle it, no. Even 25 has kind of gone by the wayside as an age of inheritance that my clients are comfortable with. 30 tends to really be the minimum age, and sometimes my clients are going up to 35 or 40. We don't want to make it overly complicated, but at the same time, we want to make sure that they will be able to hopefully handle the inheritance. Now, one of the things is the financial person that you chose, they can actually give the money early if they feel that the beneficiary can handle it. That's fine. So if you said, oh, well, let's put the age limit at 40, they could give it to the beneficiary at age 30 if they think it's appropriate. If they don't, it, they can wait all the way up to 40. The thing is, if you put 30 in, and at the time they're the most irresponsible 30-year-old on the planet, your financial person, they have to give them that money. So a lot of my clients are tending to go towards more later dates, knowing that the money could go early if the person that they trust with financial things says it's okay. So that's where we kind of bring in those age limits. So that's really around who gets what, when, and how. The other thing is I really recommend don't try to get very, very specific with things. I have a lot of clients that say, oh, I 
want money for education, no matter what. I want to specifically put in that document that if it's for education, they have to get it. Well, this will be a minute, but it's an interesting story. I do have a friend who uh, inherited a lot of money when he was younger. It went into a trust, and it said as long as he was enrolled as a full-time student, all of his ex living expenses would be paid. And so he, would en he enrolled in college as a full-time student, dropped two classes, and under the school's rules, he was still a full-time student. He'd do the work in both classes, take an incomplete in one of those classes, so he could go back and eventually and make it up. And in the other class, he usually did well, A or B. That was enough academic progress that the school wouldn't kick him out. So he kind of rigged the system to have his living expenses paid for while he became almost like a perpetual student. So that's not what most people intend. So if you're leaving it in the discretion of the financial people that you trust, they're going to be able to say yes or no. And if they looked and said, well, this is what you're doing with the money that we're spending for college, no, no, we're not going to do that. You'll get your money at 40. But up until that point, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to see some academic progress so they can fashion things. If you don't trust your financial person to make those kind of decisions, usually that's more about the person you have listed as the financial agent as opposed to actually wanting the rules. So I'd encourage you to think a little bit more about that. So that's really explaining the who gets what, when, and how. And next we'll move on to who do you actually want to raise your minor children?